what you are not. And you are not God. You're not a god? Hello, my name is Gabriel Galway and this is the Ugly Goblin. Beautiful. Have you ever looked through the monotonous list of gods inside the player's handbook? Uh, it's this massive list of names uh, that have barely any context at all. It's like, okay, cool, it's this god and it's good and they, they, they're they into farming. Uh, cool, yeah, great. <laughs> you have no visuals, no sense of personality. They're bland, they're boring, who cares? I'm gonna teach you how to make memorable gods in your world, one step at a time. I've been playing D&D for like, I don't know, 14 years now, and this is what I have learned about making gods. Whoa, did my t-shirt just change? Holy smokes, it looks so <gasps> fire. Check it out, it's Bonan the Barbarian. <laughs> the barbarian. Go get it, go check it out. I've got a shop now and it's got loads of merch. It's got t-shirts, it's got stickers, it's got basic uh, ugly goblin, we got a uh, trouble face ugly goblin. I uh, got loads of stuff. Go check it out. I don't know how to cut from here. Okay, we'll go back to the video. See you. Bye. Tip number one: uh, Don't do it. Uh, just, just don't. No, don't do it. Like, sure. Okay, listen. You let's see. Let's paint the picture. So you've got this fresh new campaign that you're writing up and you are building the world's very intricate lore. And now you want to populate it with a pantheon. That's tough to say. Okay, I'm gonna wanna let you in on a little secret. Don't stop. Don't do that. Before you do, ask yourself two questions. Have you got any players in your game who worship a god? Or is your campaign going to be heavily religious in any way? If the answer to any of those is no, then stop. Just stop writing about gods. Stop it. Stop this video, you don't need to watch it. That's it, go home. I'm done. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, don't add gods to your game. Instead, invest that time in more important aspects of your campaign. You don't need gods. Oh my god! If no one's gonna interact with them, if no one's gonna see them, they don't need to be there. And you can always add them later. But when it comes to that time when you want to finally add gods to your world, or feel the need to, uh, come back to this video. I'll be waiting here. It's going to be immortalized on YouTube. So when you're ready, return here. But if you don't need them, don't go to all the work. Okay. I never added gods into my campaign until my players were about well over level 10. They were like level 12 or 13 or something. My players have been playing in that game since they were level zero. And we've been playing this campaign for seven years. And now, yes, gods are more prominent in the game. And all of my players know who they are and what they do. And that's the important part. Making your gods memorable, which I will get to later, but also making them relevant. Which leads to my next point. Tip number two, talk with your players. So like I said, you don't need to make gods if no one's going to interact with them in any shape or form. But if they are, if you have paladins, clerics, anyone who worships a god, talk with them. If you're making a new world, talk with your players about what kind of characters they're going to make. Collaboration. That's, that's the key to any success in any TTRPG, any collaborative storytelling. That's what this is. It's a collaborative storytelling experience. If your player is going to play a character who worships a god, then ask them, what kind of god do they see their god being? Miguel and Tulio. Tulio and Miguel, mighty and powerful gods. You don't need to ask for an exact description. Keeping things vague is important and it allows for more surprises and freedom within the development of the story. But having a sense of the relationship they want to have with the god is very important for you to know and also the types of powers they want to be gifted by this god. What kind of cleric or paladin or whatever do they want to be? Knowing all of this will give you more than enough to work with when constructing these gods. And now you have 
one god. Congratulations, maybe two or three, depending if you've got a massive religious party or not. But you might find that's more than enough. That's all you need. I'll show you how to dress them up nicely very soon. But first, if you feel the need to give that god some pals or rivals, we'll hop over to my next tip. Tip number three, how to begin. So maybe you don't have players who worship a god, or you have one or two gods now, but there's a couple more you want to add to the world. And so where do you start? Let's look at how you can piece together a pantheon. My first tip for you here within this tip is to start small, as all things should when world building. You gotta start small, especially, especially when it's your first time. Simplicity is best. Then ask yourself, what are some core features of your world? What is important to its structure? And what is the story that you will be telling? You just drop in and just smack the lip, whoop, drop down, snap, ah, and then after that, you just drop in, you just ride the barrel and get pitted, so pitted is like that. Is death prominent in your world? Does a god govern over that? Is your god of life and death separate or one being? How did your world come to be? Did it exist before the gods arrive? Or did one or many gods help create it and forge it? Bob and the gang have so much fun Working together, they get the job done These questions alone can spiderweb out into oblivion, like what did the world need after it got built? Did it need water? Is there just a separate god of water? Is there a separate god of earth? Water. There was there one elemental god. I'm the avatar, you gotta deal with it. Who forged the mountains, flooded the seas with water and grew plants and things. Or maybe that was the god of life who built trees and grass and moss. I am the moss collector of this mud. I thought the mud is how I am pleased. You are a lousy moss collector. You do not deserve the duty. And you will find that your mind will continue to spiderweb out with more and more questions and you'll have to be like, okay, maybe I need a god for that and I need a god for that. Try to keep it concise. Keep it to, I don't know, five gods max. Also think about your overarching story and what's going to be covered in it. Knowing what will be covered in your story gives you a good indication as to what gods might possibly pop up. And remember, if your players haven't experienced something in your world, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And it always can later. But once you do mention something, it exists and can no longer be taken away unless you pull some serious Kingdom Hearts moves and do some wild retconning. The Heartless obey me now, Sora. Because I'm you. No, I'm me. Kyrie's inside me? You and Kyrie smell the same. They put bugs in him. I'm already half Xehanort. Listen, I've been there. It happens to the best of us. You end up making one of your characters a clone of an all-powerful Fey Lord, and that then makes them both his daughter and other half, and so then she's the sister and aunt to one of your other players in the party, and, and things get weird. <laughs> <laughs> and once it's been said, it's been said. Lean into it. That is the number one rule of improv. Anyway. My point is, it's much easier to add a little at a time than to take something away. So, when you start introducing your gods, introduce a few and sparingly at that. Which leads to my next point, keep things vague. This covers a whole different bunch of points, but most importantly, the less you show, the more you leave to your players' imaginations. And the more mysterious and omnipotent your gods feel. Less is more in this case. You want to throw mechanics and logics and hardcore magic systems out of the window when you start talking about gods. And embrace the art of a soft magic system. Hello Future Me covers hard and soft magic systems far better than I could on this channel. So go ahead over there Check out their video after this one and, and get educated. I've added the link 
into the description. So go check that out as soon as you finish this video. If you want something to feel more mystical and otherworldly, like a god in your world, then you can't restrain them with rules and logic. When describing the acts of a god, when they bestow your players with spells and blessings, try to make their presence faint. Oh my goodness. Oh. Okay, goodbye. Would you like to be in the video? Oh, you got a toy to play? Oh. Cameo. Cameo time. Hello. We got, to, we got her um, plasma fox. She's a plasma fox there. <laughs> missing their mouth they've got a mangled eye uh matted fur all over this is their best friend isn't it this is your best friend this is like um the late late toy show if you watched it any crack Nail. <laughs> you gotta watch it every year in ireland it's a great time yeah try and make your god's presence faint it could be a rippling of water when they answer one of your player's prayers. Could be a rippling of water, could be uh, a barking of a dog in the distance. Is that good? Do you like that one? Or it could be the slight trailing of wind through a section of parting mist to indicate to the players a direction they should go. You want to go down? Okay. Silence can speak a thousand words and can feel far more powerful. And then as the connections grow, have the signs become more and more prominent too. So that when they reach higher levels and their connection with their God deepens and the God feels like they can handle more of their power. I need to quote Brennan Lee Mulligan here because his logic for this, his reasoning for why wisdom is used for clerics is just so good. So just check this out very quickly. We all know that clerics draw their power from their gods, but if the gods want power, why wouldn't they just grant their most powerful spells to any and all of their followers? Why are some clerics stronger than others? It's not arcana, it's not history, it's, it's their wisdom as clerics grow in a deeper understanding of the facet of reality manifested by their deity, they become more aware and attuned to those forces within the world and can wield greater magics. There is a limit to what is safe to grant a follower. He's a genius. He's just so good. Like when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, that's just it's so cool. It's so damn cool. And it makes so much sense. And so the more power you're granted, the more prominent your god's influence becomes and now waves crash and whirlpools even form to answer your questions scales pick up and paint depictions of your deity in the wind using mist and leaves and light as their materials and maybe even one day they speak directly to your players hello derek you hearing me god Think about how satisfying that would be for your players, that progression from going from like tiny little signs that they have to piece together to now entire storms picking up when they pray to their God. Think about that journey, that forging of a connection. This is how you make your God feel powerful, distant, mysterious, and memorable all at the same time. Pacing is key to this, along with keeping their influence vague. This also helps you as a DM. It gives you more freedom to add to your god as the story progresses. Things will change and your visions of who you want this god to be will change too. So like I said, once a description is given, it's much harder to take that away. Go for the slow burn, and then when your god's true form is finally revealed to your players, and when you as a DM feel super confident as to who this god is now, that moment will be unforgettable. You're trying to atone me, and I didn't do anything wrong. Oh! Yes! Oh! And he stabs you through the heart. Oh! 
natural progression is key. And that leads into my next point. Tip number five, natural discovery. When things happen naturally, they will be remembered and fit much more smoothly into your game. This applies for both you and your players. Add to your pantheon as you need to. And when you realize there's a role that needs to be filled by a god, then you make one. A harvest festival might be coming up, and maybe your god of death and life aren't quite suitable for this. And maybe you want a god who is prayed to by farmers for a bountiful harvest, or used by apothecaries and midwives to bless their healing herbs. Maybe you need a god of fertility to cover these bases. But perhaps you also don't want this god to be as powerful as the others. And so you decide for them to become a lesser god, a child of life and the god of the earth, or perhaps love and death. Pairing up gods to make new ones is an excellent way to expand your pantheon. An entire rainbow can be produced with as little as three colors. And if you add black and white in there too, now you've got a whole spectrum of shades and the combinations become endless. And this goes back to my third tip, which is keeping things simple at first. Once you've some solid core building blocks, the world can naturally expand from those. And so over time, as you continue running your games and multiple campaigns in the same world again and again, your list of gods will grow as will its lore. But let's say you have some new players who are joining your world for the very first time. You're very proud of the history and how far you've developed the lore of this world. So you decide to dump this 40 page lore document on your new players describing your whole pantheon. And that's just, it's just not gonna work. That ain't gonna work, buddy, I'm sorry. You, you need to let your players discover the world and the gods through playing in it and discover them naturally just like you did. They need to have personal experiences and interactions with the gods as their characters. But now you as a DM are in a really, really cool position. You know loads of lore about your gods and so you can drop little hints and snippets of lore whenever and wherever you like. But obviously don't get too excited either and use this as an excuse to waffle on for about 10 minutes. You're gonna bore your players you're going to lose their interest and also your gods and the lore is going to be far less interesting. Again, less is more. That's the biggest, biggest takeaway from this. They can always learn more about the gods as the games progress. But the less you tell them, the more mysterious this will all be and the more mystical these gods will feel. But whenever you feel it necessary, ask your players to make a history or religion check to discover something new about these gods. And little by little, through these personal experiences and through their own merit, they will learn about these gods and the information about them will stick in their memory far more. As opposed to when you just give them a giant lore document, they're going to reject it. They're, they're going to throw it away. They're not going to be interested. They're going to be like, oh, this is homework. But if that information is earned and it feels earned, they're going to cherish it. And that's going to be so much more precious to your players. If you give them the big document, that's the exact same as looking at this which was how I opened the video. Look how boring this is. It's, it's, it sucks. It's like, okay, this is kind of good. Uh, I don't know, they, they like olives. That's their symbol. Um, you don't know anything about this god. So, so why would you care? So if you want your pantheon to work and you want it to come naturally to both you and your players, then you need to let it develop naturally. Creating a pantheon is a journey and it takes time. And this is the end of the video. There we go. <laughs> and you might have noticed I haven't gone into the details on how to design the personality and physical descriptions of your god, nor have I gone into symbolism or acolytes or places of worship. And that's mainly because each of those topics could be an entire video all on their own. How to write a strong personality for any type of character in your world is a very good topic solely on its own that should be given the time and attention that it needs and can't just be crammed into one video. But these are topics that I will definitely cover in the future, especially if you're interested. Let me know in the comments if you are, and also let me know what other kind of videos related to this you want to see. We could go into the design process of making a god, for example, or how to give your NPCs personality. 
And also, if you enjoy my content, please like and subscribe. It means a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. And if you want more juicy content than what I'm just producing here on YouTube, you should go check out my Patreon. I've got sample NPCs, magic items, monsters, and more. Head over there, uh, check it out. You can become a patron for as little as $1. See, Blue, Blue thinks you should. So, I mean, if the dog's saying it, then you should probably go and check it out. Hello, I just wanted to also give a very special shout out and thank you to all the patrons who've supported me this month. Blue also thanks you so, so much. Um, you're all fantastic. Thank you, especially to Ike the Architects, our very first member of the Giga Chad Council. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to our fancy goblins as well who've, who've joined. Uh, thank you. Q C H T O Q Q T O. Thank you, thank you, one regular, and uh, thank you, Murphy Bridges as well. Thank you so much for, for taking part in the Patreon and and supporting me, supporting Blue. Uh, I promise I won't eat all of the money as food. Um, and also thank you to um, my pajama goblin Archie Galway, uh, my brother. Thank you very much for supporting me. Um, all right, I have a funny thing to say, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. But that's all for me. Um, thank you so much for watching and have a great time gaming, playing tabletop games, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. I'm off into the void. Come up into the void. <laughs>